There is a large and growing number of unconventional therapies available to pet owners. These are approaches to treating disease or maintaining health, which differ from the conventional scientific-based medicine that is usually taught in veterinary schools. And these alternative therapies differ quite a bit from one another as well. This graphic just illustrates one way in which these practices can be categorized. Biologically based approaches, manipulative approaches, energy therapies, therapies which can really be viewed more as spiritual practices than, strictly speaking, medical practices. However, many of these unconventional approaches are employed together in combination, and they are generally talked about together under the heading of alternative medicine. There are some other terms that are frequently used. Complementary and alternative medicine is a common one, abbreviated CAM, and integrative medicine is a newer term. We'll talk a little bit later about the, the details of some of the terminology in this area. Now because these therapies are unconventional and not generally taught in veterinary schools, many veterinarians are not familiar with the details of them. And many, many veterinarians are not entirely sure how to go about evaluating these unconventional therapies. They may have theoretical foundations which are quite different from the scientific principles that veterinarians are taught in school. So the purpose of this presentation is to provide a toolbox or an approach for evaluating unconventional therapies that you may not be very familiar with. Apart from knowing something about alternative veterinary therapies and how to evaluate them from the point of view of practicing the best medicine possible, it's important to be familiar with these practices because pet owners will have questions about them. Pet owners are often very well informed about the options available to them when their pets are ill and very interested in methods that are promoted with the claims that they will keep their pets healthy and so they're likely to come to you with questions about methods that you may not be familiar with and they will often have information from apparently reliable sources about these methods. Unfortunately, as we all know, the internet is a mixed blessing. There is a lot of information available about alternative veterinary practices and it is easy for pet owners to investigate diseases that their pets may have or to look at possible ways to prevent disease in their companions. Unfortunately, there's no easy way for pet owners to evaluate the quality or the accuracy of information on the internet. In fact, a great deal of the information that's available about alternative veterinary therapies is commercial in origin. And that raises the obvious question of whether this information can be entirely trusted to be accurate or impartial. Hopefully, pet owners will come to you as the veterinarian to ask questions about the information that they find on the internet and to get guidance about some of these unconventional therapies. Because these are practices that are often not talked about in vet school very much, you may not automatically have uh, an answer for them. And clearly it's not reasonable for any veterinarian to be expected to be an expert in all the possible therapies available. However, it is possible to provide reliable and accurate answers to your clients and to give them some guidance when they're considering employing some of these alternative methods. And again, the purpose of this presentation is to provide you with some tools to be able to do that effectively. I'm going to draw on a variety of disciplines in order to help build this toolbox. Critical thinking is an area that explores how people make decisions, how we evaluate things that we are unfamiliar with and come to conclusions about them. And it is particularly an area that looks at the ways in which this process of judging or evaluating can go wrong. So critical thinking provides us with some useful insight into how we may make the wrong decisions or the wrong judgments and this gives us the opportunity to guard against those kinds of errors. So critical thinking skills are very important when evaluating veterinary therapies or products about which there may not be a great deal of reliable scientific information or which you may not be familiar with. 
Another domain that I will draw on in helping to create an approach to evaluating these practices is evidence-based medicine. This is an approach, a set of methods, and also a philosophical perspective on how we best determine which therapies are effective and safe and which may not be. It's become the dominant approach in human medicine because it's very effective and because it helps to compensate for some of the weaknesses in our ability to make judgments that we'll talk about in the critical thinking section. So we'll look at evidence-based medicine methodologies and how they can be applied in a practical way to evaluating unconventional veterinary therapies. So to start with, here is my shocking and controversial thesis. Science works. Science is certainly not perfect. Nothing that human beings do is infallible, but as a set of methods, science is the most effective way we've ever come across to figure out how the world works. And it is the most effective way for us to understand how medical practices work and whether they are effective or ineffective, safe or unsafe, and so on. Winston Churchill is famous for having said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the other forms that have been tried. And I think this sentiment applies very well to science as an epistemology. Epistemology is a term I'll use often throughout this presentation. It's just a philosophical term which means an approach to knowledge, to figuring out how we know what we know. So to take some liberties with uh, Mr. Churchill's comment, science is the worst form of epistemology except for all those other forms that have been tried. And I think we'll see as we go through some of the discussions about particular uh, practices in alternative veterinary medicine that there are some very different epistemological approaches in that area. And there is a sense among some practitioners of these unconventional approaches that science is not the best way to understand what works and what doesn't. I think the evidence is actually very clear that, that that's mistaken, that science works. Here's a simple but I think quite stark illustration of this idea. This is just a graph of global life expectancy over about the last 12,000 years. Clearly, the record is not 100% accurate and the specific age may differ somewhat, but there really is no controversy that the pattern is essentially as shown in this graph. This is a representation of when we began as a species trying to figure out what caused disease and how to treat disease. Essentially, as far back as, as anyone can identify, human beings have tried to manage our health and to treat our diseases and make ourselves better. In fact, there's some limited evidence that other animals may seek out methods, uh, plants for example, to try to make themselves feel better when they're ill. So for thousands of years, we have tried through trial and error, through experimentation as individuals, through traditions, through folk mythology, to find ways to make ourselves healthier and to treat our diseases. And as the graph shows, we've not been terribly successful in making clear and objective changes in the quality or the length of our life. Ayurveda is a set of approaches involving both herbal medications and uh, other practices uh, that originated in India quite some time ago. And that is one of the approaches that will sometimes be seen uh, uh, among veterinary alternative practitioners. Acupuncture is something that most people are familiar with and it is part of a larger set of ideas often referred to as traditional Chinese medicine. There's actually quite a bit of debate about how long acupuncture has been practiced in the form that we recognize today and particularly about whether or not it's been applied to animals historically or if that's a modern innovation. But regardless, some form of this practice has been around for thousands of years. Again, no dramatic impact on how long people have lived. Humoral medicine is actually traditional Western medicine. Often conventional science-based medicine will be called Western medicine to distinguish it from practices from other cultures such as Chinese medicine or Ayurveda. However, the traditional form of healthcare in Europe, in the West, 
has been humoral medicine. This is the notion that Galen and others in the Greek world uh, invented, which explained health and disease in terms of the balance of bodily humors, blood and bile, that sort of thing, and which was the theoretical underpinning for bloodletting, for the use of leeches, for emetics and purgatives, and many of the methods that were used in the West prior to the development of, of scientific medicine. Also a fairly long-standing and not very effective approach to health. This is about the point where the methods of modern science began to emerge. Obviously that was a process and it took hundreds of years and we are still refining the methods by which we investigate the world through science. But in a few hundred years we have had a far more dramatic impact on the length and quality of human life than in the preceding 10,000 years. And I don't believe that's an accident. I believe that's an illustration of how science works and how effective it is as an epistemology. This is just a slightly more recent illustration of the same process. Human life expectancy has been steadily increasing since the early 19th century, and the data for this is quite a bit more reliable because this is during the historical period, and it illustrates the same general trend. I think another interesting thing that this graph shows is that the improvement in human life expectancy has been noticeably greater in those nations that have the resources to fully implement the scientific approach to medical care. There are a number of other variables that one could graph in this way, which would show the same thing. Things like infant mortality, the prevalence of certain infectious diseases, and the parasite loads. However, life expectancy is a nice, clear illustration of the impact that our change in how we understand health and disease and how we manage health and disease has had on human well-being. The same is quite likely true for our animal companions, particularly in the more recent period of the last several decades. There's not good data to illustrate that, but I think it's a reasonable assumption. In 1796, the first vaccine was developed for smallpox. Inoculation was an attempt uh, to prevent disease uh, that was somewhat similar and had been practiced earlier than this, but the smallpox vaccine was the first one to be developed in the process that we would recognize as a scientific one today, albeit in a somewhat rudimentary form. 1860, Lister began to promote the notion of asepsis, that sterilizing an environment of infectious organisms, washing one's hands between patients, were practices that would have a significant impact on morbidity uh, within uh, patients in the hospital. 1928, the first antibiotic, penicillin, was developed, and the number and variety of those medications have proliferated dramatically since then and have had a very positive impact on human health. For all the concerns uh, recently about the misuse of antibiotics and their potential consequences, they are unquestionably one of the most important and beneficial medical interventions ever developed. And in 1980, we eliminated smallpox as a disease. It ceased to exist. This is something that, as far as we know, is absolutely unprecedented in human history. Tens of thousands of years of approaching health and disease in the traditional ways were unable to, as far as we know, ever eliminate completely a significant source of illness. And in a less than 100 years, using the scientific approach, we have managed to do that. And I think that's a pretty stark illustration of how effective science is as a way of coming to understand and then manipulate our health and our illness. Bottom line is that science works. As I said before and will illustrate, certainly it's not perfect. It's like any other human endeavor, full of, of weaknesses and potential biases and errors that come from the way that our brains work, and we'll certainly talk about that. However, it is by far unquestionably the most effective approach we've ever come across to understanding the world and to altering the world. And inclu that includes, in particular, understanding and altering our health. So how did we try to understand the world? In particular, how did we try to understand health and disease 
and the effect of our medical interventions before we had the scientific approach. There are a number of strategies which people naturally use in trying to understand the world around them, in trying to evaluate cause and effect and see whether or not the actions they take are having the consequences that they would like. As pet owners, as patients, as doctors, we employ these methods all the time. However, these approaches to understanding health and disease have some inherent weaknesses. And one of the reasons that science has been so successful is that it is a method that specifically compensates for the limitations of our natural methods for ev investigating and evaluating things. One ubiquitous method that all of us use all the time is individual observation or experience. Doctors will say, I tried therapy X and the problem went away, so therapy X must work. Clients will come to you and say, my pet had this problem, I bought this product or I used this method that my neighbor had recommended and the problem went away. So you should know that this therapy or this product is effective. Unfortunately, the emotionally compelling nature of that kind of individual experience is not correlated with how accurate a method it is for assessing whether something is truly helping in the case of disease. I'm going to use bloodletting as an example of a medical practice that for thousands of years was almost universally accepted as beneficial based primarily on some of these methods for evaluating medical therapies that predate the scientific method and which we still often rely on today. Bloodletting is an excellent example because it was very popular. All of the brightest minds in science and medicine for thousands of years believed in its effectiveness. Patients would testify to the dramatic benefits they had experienced from having been treated with bloodletting. And it had a sound theoretical foundation on the basis of the theories and understanding of health and disease that existed during the time that it was popular. It is, however, also a therapy that we now know without any doubt does far more harm than good. And I think it's an excellent illustration of how dramatically our natural methods for evaluating medical therapies can lead us astray. This is just a quote from a medical publication in the early 19th century when the practice of bloodletting was beginning to be challenged and there was some debate about whether or not it was as effective as it had always been believed to be. Who is there with 10 or 20 years experience in the profession that has not seen the most marked advantages from bleeding in the protracted state of fever? This is a doctor saying, I know bloodletting works. I've done it many, many times. Every doctor has done it and seen how effective it is. Individual observation and experience validated this practice. Another approach to understanding whether or not a medical therapy is effective is looking at the history or tradition of that practice. We've practiced therapy X forever. All those doctors, all those patients couldn't possibly have been wrong for all those years. And this is a form of evaluation that is still practiced widely today. We tend to do things in medicine often because we always have, or at least we have the perception that we always have. Another defense of bloodletting says, he thought it really saying too much that we should assume to be so much wiser than our fathers who had lent their approval to a custom that had been sanctioned by ages of experience. Bloodletting was, like every other medical therapy in the pre-scientific era, validated largely on the basis that people had always done it and how could they have been wrong for so long. Extrapolations from an underlying theory of health and disease, or simple common sense, are ways that frequently people justify unconventional and conventional therapies in the absence of extensive scientific evidence to support them. If we know X is true, and Y seems obviously to follow from X, then Y must be true as well. It's a very straightforward and compelling kind of reasoning. And it was one of the ways in which the practice of bloodletting was justified for a long time. Benjamin Rush was a well-known physician and one of the most staunch defenders of the practice of bloodletting when this practice began to be challenged. 
And this is just an example of a theoretical justification for the practice based on how health and disease were understood under the humoral system of medicine that predated the scientific system in the West. I have called the spleen a basin furnished by nature to hold redundant blood. Okay, so the theory is that the spleen exists to hold extra blood. Now the spleen is sometimes too small and so overcharged with blood that it cannot perform this office. So sometimes the spleen just can't hold all the blood it needs to hold. The great enlargement and engorgement of the spleen in fatal cases of bilious fever proves the truth of this remark. In cases where not enough bloodletting has been done by Rush's judgment, and the patients die and we look at their spleen, and their spleen is huge, this suggests that, in fact, the spleen is not able to hold all the blood, and we should have let more blood out of the patient. It's a perfectly sound, logical, theoretical justification that unfortunately is completely wrong. And yet it was very compelling to very bright minds in medicine. So what are we doing now? Obviously, we always think, as every generation does, that we are living in a more enlightened age and that we understand things more effectively and more thoroughly and more accurately than people before us did. So we must be using better methods to validate our therapies than people used to use. Unfortunately, in both unconventional and conventional medicine, that often is not true. Individual observation and experience is still the cornerstone of most veterinarians' practice. Much of what we do as doctors, we do on the basis of what we have seen and observed and experienced as individual clinicians. This is an example not from a veterinarian, but from a dairy herd manager who is describing the use of homeopathy in a cow with dystocia. And he goes on to describe how the cow was having difficulty calving, and he applied this remedy, and about 45 minutes later, the calf was born live and everything was well. What I think is interesting about this is how he justifies using this experience to validate a controversial therapy, despite the fact that we now have the scientific method and we now generally accept that as the best way to make these kinds of judgments. I readily accept this is not a scientific experiment that would satisfy the cynically minded. This implies that requiring scientific evidence to justify your practices is somehow cynical. But when one saw this repeatedly over a period of 15 years, it held much greater sway for us than any scientific experiment. Let it not be forgotten that all we were doing was using the homeopathic experience gained by thousands of other people over a great length of time. So we've tossed in both a little individual experience and also a little reference to history or tradition as a justification for something and as a justification for dismissing the need for science as a way of validating whether this is actually an effective therapy or not. The key here is that individual experiences are deeply compelling psychologically and emotionally. And it is difficult and unnatural for us to ignore those experiences in favor of objective scientific data, even when we may know intellectually that science is a more effective approach. This is another example from a veterinarian who was writing a letter to the Canadian Veterinary Journal in response to some criticisms of alternative veterinary practices. As a veterinarian now practicing homeopathy and chiropractic almost exclusively, I have all the proof I need every day in my practice to justify these modalities. Again, even in the age of scientific medicine, it is very difficult for people to accept the unreliability of their own personal experiences and defer to more objective scientific evidence about whether or not the things that they are doing are effective. History and tradition are still commonly used as justifications for medical interventions that may not have extensive scientific evidence to support them. This veterinary acupuncturist, also trained in traditional science-based medicine, says, how does acupuncture work? We know that it does work from thousands of years of experience. Another veterinarian who practices acupuncture talks about traditional Chinese veterinary medicine and says, 
Traditional Chinese veterinary medicine has been used in China for about 3,000 years. Originally, the practice was handed down from father to son, and you were only paid if you made your patient well. So either you got good at it, or your family line died out. This is a justification based on the idea that something must be effective because people have believed it to be effective for a very long time. And in the case of the second quote, a rather unusual argument that if it weren't effective, people who made their living practicing that kind of medicine wouldn't have been successful and their line would have died out along with the practice some time ago. Obviously, these are pre-scientific ways of justifying particular medical practices, but they're still being employed by people in the modern era and by people who have been trained in the conventional scientific way of evaluating medical therapies. So for some, at least, history and tradition are still quite compelling forms of justification, even in the modern scientific era. Theory and common sense are still used as a method for explaining why something must be an effective therapy, whether or not there is good scientific evidence to support it. This is a rather extensive description of some of the principles of traditional Chinese veterinary medicine, and it simply talks about the theory underlying it, yin and yang, the eight principles, a number of details which are, are not in themselves important. The second half of the quote, though, talks about the relationship of these theoretical principles to disease and to the scientific approach to disease. For example, a cat with a Western biomedical diagnosis of hyperthyroidism would usually have a red tongue, thin body, high metabolic rate, rapid pulse. These are yang characteristics. Traditional Chinese veterinary medicine treatment principles are based upon heteropathy, treat to create the opposite condition that is diagnosed. So this yang hyperthyroid cat would benefit by yin nourishing foods, herbs, and acupuncture and feng shui treatments. So this is a veterinarian who, again, is trained in the traditional scientific way of approaching medicine, but has also been trained in an entirely different alternative approach, and who finds the theoretical justifications of that alternative to be sufficient in and of themselves to justify using these alternative interventions, again, regardless of whether or not there's actual scientific evidence to support doing so. So reasoning from basic theory is still a common way that we justify our practices, even though we know that that has historically been not a very accurate or effective way to decide which of our therapies work and which don't. I believe the first step in developing an effective and appropriate method for evaluating all of our therapies, but particularly unconventional therapies, is to have a healthy quantity of self-doubt. One thing that these methods that we've just talked about for evaluating our interventions have in common is that they rely on trusting the experience of individuals, the aggregated experience of history, or our own extrapolations from our theoretical understandings. They require a certain confidence in our own judgments. Science, on the other hand, requires some doubt about the reliability of our individual judgments. And I think part of the key to its success has been that self-doubt. This is a remark from Mark Crisplip, who's an infectious disease specialist who writes a lot about alternative medicine on the human side. Often getting the right diagnosis and therapy is less about what you know and more about being rigorous about understanding how you know. Only when you are conscious of your ability to think poorly can you compensate. I'm hoping to help us all to be a little more conscious of our ability to think poorly so that we can use the methods that science has made available to us to compensate for that. A slightly more casual way of saying the same thing is the real purpose of the scientific method is to make sure nature hasn't misled you into thinking you know something you actually don't know. Science helps to compensate for the inherent vulnerabilities and weaknesses in our own natural approaches to understanding the world around us. So I'm going to begin by investigating and illustrating some of the ways in which our judgments about health and disease and about the effectiveness of our therapies go wrong. 
both due to the nature of the diseases that we treat in the world that we're trying to understand, and also due to the inherent weaknesses in our own mental processes. Once we understand that, I think we'll be better able to make effective use of the principles and methods of science to more accurately and reliably evaluate unconventional medical therapies. I'm going to go over some of the more common ways that we can be mistaken in the judgments we make about the effectiveness of particular medical interventions. I will say from the beginning that the number of sources of error is nearly infinite, and I'm only going to cover a small selection of perhaps the most important and most obvious ways in which we can make mistakes in our judgments. I'm also going to ignore some sources of error that I think are not really important for our purposes. One of them is simple incompetence. I think that certainly we can make mistakes if we're not competent as researchers or clinicians, but I don't think that that contributes significantly and fundamentally to some of the problems in how we evaluate our medical therapies. I'll ignore the idea of deliberate fraud as a significant source of error. I think that that's probably quite rare. Most of the examples that I'll give come from an essay found on quackwatch.com by Dr. Barry Beierstein called Why Bogus Therapies Often Seem to Work. Most of that essay seems to have been based on a somewhat more academic publication on the importance of cognitive errors in diagnosis and strategies to minimize them. I think the title of this article itself is a quick and efficient way of explaining what science really does. It identifies cognitive errors in diagnosis and in understanding how health and disease work and then develop strategies to minimize these. I'm going to divide the errors that I talk about into two categories. The first category are mistakes we make in our judgments because of the nature of the diseases that we're trying to treat. The second category we'll come to in a minute are things that we make mistakes about because of the nature of how our brains work. Self-limiting diseases fool us. A self-limiting disease is a disease that goes away by itself. And it's very easy with these kinds of disorders for us to misunderstand the cause-effect relationship between what we do and what happens to the patient. Most patients get better on their own. I think Benjamin Franklin famously said, God cures the patient and the doctor collects the fee. It's true that many diseases get better with time and anything we do will appear to be effective, even if it's not. This is known more formally in, in philosophy as the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy, the idea that because one thing happens and then another thing happens, the second is due to the first. It's a logical assumption to make that if a patient comes in with a problem and we give them a medication and the problem goes away, that we've made that problem go away with that medication. Unfortunately, careful, rigorous scientific research often shows that that's not true. So to prove that a therapy actually works, we need to compare the rate at which patients who are treated recover with the rate at which patients who are not treated recover. And there are several very classic examples of this in veterinary medicine. Viral upper respiratory infections in cats, for example, go away by themselves. And no one has demonstrated conclusively that anything that we do has a really dramatic effect on how long those take to go away. However, because they go away on their own, it's very easy for a client to come in and get an antibiotic prescription, which we know very definitively is not going to be helpful, and then for that antibiotic to appear to be helpful because the disease has gone away on its own. Another example is something called feline interstitial cystitis. This is a disorder which fooled the veterinary profession for quite a long time. Cats present with blood in their urine, straining to urinate, all of the symptoms of what is in other species often a bacterial urinary tract infection. And these cats would frequently be given antibiotics for five to seven days, and within a week, ten days, they would be better. And then when careful scientific research was done on the subject, it was found that no bacterial infection could be identified, and cats who were not treated at all got better just as soon as cats who were treated. This is an example of how self-limiting diseases can lead us to the wrong conclusions about the effectiveness of our treatments. A slightly different example of how the nature of disease can fool us is the phenomenon of regression to the mean. Regression to the mean simply means that in a chronic disease, 
these symptoms come and go over time. And so as those symptoms reach a peak, and perhaps the owner of the pet seeks out medical care, those symptoms are naturally going to be returning to their baseline or even improving beyond that because the natural course of the disease is for those symptoms to come and go. So symptoms of chronic disease come and go. Again, this means that to prove a therapy is actually working, we need to know what would have happened if we didn't treat the patient. Classic examples of this are diseases like arthritis, in which the symptoms often are better and worse and come and go over time and allergies, where the itching that a patient experiences from allergic skin disease may be gradually increasing over time and reaching a peak and then gradually improving on its own. And at any point at which we intervene, it's difficult to know without proper scientific research whether our intervention is changing the course of the symptoms or they're changing on their This graph is an illustration of the phenomenon of regression to the mean as it manifests in allergic skin disease. The graph shows the amount of pruritus or itching over time in a dog that has skin allergies. This is how the symptoms would progress over time without any treatment at all. The level of itching rises and falls naturally on its own around a midpoint, which in this example maybe is somewhere around four or five on the scale. Six is the level of itching that becomes disturbing to the owner. The dog may be scratching all night and the collar is jingling or the dog is beginning to injure its skin and the owner notices this. This is the point at which the owner is motivated to bring the patient in to see the veterinarian. So they make an appointment a couple of days later, the dog comes in to see the veterinarian and some therapy is instituted to improve the symptoms. And then being diligent, the doctor calls the owner back a week or so later to see how things are going. And sure enough, the symptoms have improved significantly. They've dropped back below the owner's threshold. This can easily be taken to mean that the therapy is effective and it may be that the therapy has been effective. But as we've seen, this graph illustrates what the symptoms would do in the absence of any therapy at all. And so it's possible that the appearance of a benefit from the therapy is in fact simply an illusion created by the phenomenon of regression to the mean. Now I'm going to move on to some of the errors in how we evaluate medical therapies that come from the way that our brains work. And as I said before, there are many of these. I'm going to touch on just a few and hopefully some of the most important. The placebo effect is certainly a phenomenon that most people are familiar with, though I think most people have uh, an unduly simplistic notion of what it means. Classically, the placebo effect is the illusion of improvement generated in a human patient by the belief that they've been given an effective therapy. It is an effect that only influences subjective symptoms primarily and that has its greatest influence based on the amount of belief or faith that the person has in the therapy they're being given. In veterinary medicine, this is not by itself a significant source of error in our patients because obviously our patients don't have beliefs or expectations about their therapies. So the placebo effect in the classical sense works mostly by proxy through the owner and the veterinarian. Most of our understanding of how our patient's symptoms are going comes from the reports of the owner or from our own observations. And so if an owner is giving a therapy that we've told them to give or that they've been encouraged will have a benefit and they see a benefit, it may be that this is a placebo by proxy effect. There are some ways in which so-called placebo effects can actually affect our patients directly. Classical conditioning is an example. The uh, classic example of this is Pavlov and his dogs where they were made to salivate by the presence of food, which is an autonomic reflex. And the presentation of food was paired with a bell so that eventually they learned to salivate automatically at the sound of the bell. However, what is less known is that another aspect of this experiment uh, that Pavlov conducted was to measure the level of 
stomach acid in these dogs when food was presented and to pair that with the bell as well. And he was able to show that through classical conditioning, even such a completely unconscious reflex as the production of acid in the stomach can be generated by a, an intervention, a, a conditioned stimulus that doesn't actually have any physiological effects. So there are some ways in which classical conditioning can generate physical changes in our patients that don't actually result from an effective therapy. And human interaction has an effect on our patients as well. They respond both in terms of behavior and also in terms of autonomic reflexes to interaction with people. Uh, for most of our domesticated animal species, certainly companion animals, they've been bred precisely for this, to have a response to human interaction. And so it's not surprising that human interaction can generate some responses that can be mistaken for the effects of a truly effective therapy. So once again, to prove that a therapy works, we need studies which have a placebo control component in which the owner, the veterinarian, whomever is making the evaluation of the effect of the therapy doesn't know which patients are getting the therapy and which are getting the placebo. Even with good studies, we can be fooled. There are other effects that occur when animals and human beings are involved in a research trial that can generate the appearance of an effect without actually having an effective therapy. So it's important that any studies that do show an effect can be replicated and repeated so that we can see that that effect is real. Again, examples of, of the kind of conditions in which placebo controls are important are diseases like arthritis, where again, chronic waxing waning symptoms, which are often subjectively evaluated by owners or veterinarians watching the patient. It's important to have a placebo control to know whether our therapies are truly having the effects that we think they are. Epilepsy. Now epilepsy may be surprising. Having seizures is like production of stomach acid, certainly an unconscious and uncontrollable manifestation of disease. And it may be counterintuitive that we would need to have a placebo control in an epilepsy trial because how could there possibly be a placebo effect on a symptom such as seizure? It turns out, however, that there has been a study of the effect of placebos on epilepsy symptoms in dogs, published in the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine, which found that in one study, 79% of dogs that received a placebo had a decrease in their seizure frequency. And 30% of these dogs had a sufficient decrease in seizure frequency that they would have been judged as responding positively to the medication had they actually been given a medication instead of an inert placebo. For three other trials that were evaluated, there was an average reduction in the frequency of seizures in the placebo group of somewhere between 25 and 45% a pretty significant decrease in a fairly objective symptom of disease in dogs that were receiving a fake therapy. So how do we explain this? The authors list several possible explanations for this. Regression to the mean, which we've already talked about, is certainly one. The frequency of seizures in a chronic epileptic case change over time and it may be that these patients are being enrolled in a clinical study because they're at a high point in their seizure frequency and the frequency of seizures is going to be decreasing anyway as part of the natural course of the disease. Investigator bias, client bias, it may be that if the studies are not sufficiently blinded the investigators or the owners know whether their particular patients are getting placebo or active treatment and that affects a number of things in how they are evaluated and how their care is managed by the owners and by the investigators, which can have an influence on seizure rates. The potential for a higher level of care during the study. People and animals in clinical trials are monitored more closely, see doctors more often, and generally have a higher level of medical care than they have when they're not on a study. And that can generate an improvement in their condition, regardless of whether they're actually getting an active therapy as part of the study or they're in the placebo group. And people and also owners of pets who are in clinical trials tend to stick to their treatment regimes more diligently and more uh, 
consistently when they know they're part of a clinical trial and they're being monitored. So it may be that these dogs were on multiple medications and that the medication that they were already getting outside of the clinical trial was not being given consistently and when they entered the clinical trial even though they were on the placebo group their disease improved because their owners were giving their other medications more consistently as a response to being part of a clinical study. So there are a lot of ways in which placebo effects can manifest in clinical trials of animals even when there is no belief or expectation to generate the classical placebo effect. So it's important that we have placebo controls in our clinical trials. So what does this mean? It means we have to take our conclusions with a grain of salt. Even though something is demonstrated in a scientific research study, it may be that that is not actually a true ex example of how this therapy that we're studying is working because of some of the effects that we've talked about here. Another source of error that comes from how our brains work are the, is the phenomenon known as confirmation bias and its close relative cognitive dissonance. These are psychological terms which illustrate things that most people already know about, just not in this terminology. We notice and we remember things which confirm our beliefs. And we have a tendency to ignore or to forget about those things which contradict what we believe. Confirmation bias or noticing what are called the hits, the things that support our argument, and ignoring the misses, the things that don't support our argument, is a common, almost universal human behavior, and it can contribute to our drawing the wrong conclusion about medical therapies. We also hate to be wrong, and we really hate to accept that we're wrong or admit it to other people. Cognitive dissonance is a term for that feeling of discomfort that we experience when some part of us realizes that we've made a mistake. And it is a feeling that motivates us to try to diminish the evidence of our error, to reduce our own culpability, and to ignore the mistake we've made rather than accepting it and moving on. These are not new ideas, even though the terminology is relatively new. The understanding of human psychology behind this is quite old. In the 17th century, Francis Bacon said, the human understanding, when it is once adopted an opinion, draws all things else to support and agree with it. And though there be a greater number and weight of instances to be found on the other side, yet these it either neglects or despises. This is a marvelous description of confirmation bias. From a more literary source, Leo Tolstoy wrote, I know that most men can seldom accept even the simplest and most obvious truth, if it be such as would oblige them to admit the falsity of conclusions, which they have delighted in explaining to colleagues, which they have proudly taught to others, and which they have woven thread by thread into the fabric of their lives. This is an expression of the phenomenon of cognitive dissonance. And this is particularly pertinent to medicine because many of the unconventional and alternative therapies that we're going to talk about are provided by people who make that the center of their professional practice and have woven the theories and the ideas about these practices thread by thread into the fabric of their lives. And it's very difficult for people who have staked so much of their understanding of the world and of their evaluation of their own competence as a healthcare provider on one of these practices to accept evidence that it may not in fact have the benefits they believe. So what's the bottom line here? Errors are more common and more subtle than we think. We make mistakes in our judgments about the effects of our interventions that we often don't realize and that have a significant effect on our overall understanding of how our actions are affecting our patients. We tend as human beings to see what we look for, to see what we expect to see, and we tend to remember things which confirm our beliefs and ignore or forget or dismiss those things which show that we're wrong. And unfortunately, the evidence is pretty strong in the area of psychology that being intelligent, being well-educated, having a lot of experience as a professional, 
or having the best of intentions. None of these things protect us much from these common errors in judgment. These are errors that arise from the fundamental nature of both the diseases that we treat and the way that our brains work. And what protects us effectively against these errors are not our own education, our own experiences, or our own intentions, but methods and practices that help us to more effectively gather and evaluate information. And these methods are the methods of science. So what do we do? Knowing that we're prone to errors and that we can be fooled, what should we do? Well, philosophically, the first thing we should do is accept this, accept our limitations, and commit ourselves to looking for ways to make better judgments. We have to accept that the judgments of individuals, however much we respect them, is less reliable than the assessment of objective scientific research. This is a philosophical principle that is fundamental to practicing science-based medicine. And it is a core principle of the set of methods known as evidence-based medicine, which we'll talk about shortly. And I think it's important that we accept that skepticism is a necessary part of making better and more effective judgments. Skepticism is often misunderstood to mean automatic rejection of new ideas, and that's not what it is intended to mean at all. Skepticism simply means that any claim that is made should be viewed neutrally as neither true nor false until there is some compelling objective evidence either way. And in medicine, that evidence is generally scientific research. So skepticism critique and debate are tools we use to improve our practice and our understanding. They're natural and essential parts of the scientific method. So if we challenge each other's understandings in the profession, each other's techniques, this shouldn't be viewed as disrespectful, but as a necessary part of working together as a community to improve the medicine that we offer to our patients. What do we do on a practical basis to respond to this understanding about the weaknesses in our judgments? Well, the first thing I think we have to do is we have to devise and use methods for evaluating our therapies and for guiding our clinical judgments that account for the weaknesses inherent in how we evaluate these things without a formal scientific methodology and that compensate for these weaknesses. There is such a set of methods, and it's called evidence-based medicine. And in a minute, we'll talk about what exactly evidence-based medicine in general is, what evidence-based veterinary medicine is. But the bottom line is that it is the philosophical acceptance of the inherent limitations of human judgment and an acceptance of the superiority of formal, rigorous, scientific methods for evaluating medical therapies over individual judgment, tradition, history, or extrapolation from first principles. So what is evidence-based veterinary medicine? One of the founders of evidence-based medicine in the human field, Dr. Sackett, provided this definition. Evidence-based medicine is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of the current best evidence for making decisions about the care of individual patients. The practice of evidence-based medicine means integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research. Another editorial uh, on the subject of evidence-based medicine in response to some concerns and criticisms about it added a couple of points to that definition. The integration of the best research evidence with our clinical expertise, which is a reflection of the Sackett definition, and our patients' unique values and circumstances. Now, this allows for a more individualized approach to the circumstances of individual patients, even while still incorporating 
objective clinical research done on groups. In evidence-based veterinary medicine, the values and circumstances are more often those of the owner than the patient, but the same principle applies. So what can we draw out of these definitions that illustrates the core principles of an evidence-based approach to medicine? Evidence-based medicine is conscientious. That means we have to make an effort. We have to continually reevaluate our practices. We have to be seeking out and critically evaluating new scientific evidence. We can't simply continue in our habits based on our own experience, based on the advice or training of our mentors. We must conscientiously reevaluate therapies that we have engaged in for a long time and also therapies that we're considering that are new and evaluate them in terms of the current best evidence. An evidence-based approach is explicit. We're often faced with a situation in veterinary medicine where we don't have high quality, large volume clinical trial evidence to tell us whether a particular therapy works or not. And as we'll see later, that doesn't necessarily mean we don't use therapies like that. What it means is that we have to be explicit about the limitations of the evidence behind our practices. And I think a key feature here is that we need to be explicit with our clients about the limitations in the evidence concerning the recommendations that we make to them. Evidence-based medicine is about optimizing the care that we provide to individual patients. While we make extensive use of research that is done on groups of people, it is not correct to say that evidence-based medicine ignores the individual. We certainly do practice in an evidence-based way for the sole purpose of improving the quality of care that we provide to individual patients. And we do integrate the values of our clients and the unique circumstances of every individual patient in the decisions we make in an evidence-based way. We obviously have to stay current on what the best evidence is, and current evidence doesn't necessarily come only from the opinions of leading thinkers in the profession. The continuing education practice currently is primarily to go to lectures and to hear what are often the opinions of well-respected, experienced clinicians. And certainly those opinions have value, but as we'll see in a short while, on the hierarchy of evidence under the evidence-based medicine approach, those opinions are not as high a level of evidence as more formal controlled research. And we need to rely on the best evidence currently available to guide our clinical practices. As I mentioned before, integrating the various aspects of an evidence-based medicine approach is important. We certainly have to account for the expertise of individual clinicians. Evidence-based medicine does not require you to throw out what you know or what you're familiar with. It simply requires you to be conscientious and explicit about integrating your own experience and expertise with the current best evidence. And the values and circumstances of each individual case are absolutely vital to managing our practice in an evidence-based way. The simplest example of this is that if a client doesn't have the resources to utilize a particular therapy or doesn't wish to utilize a particular therapy, then the quality of the clinical evidence supporting that therapy is largely irrelevant. The values and circumstances of each individual case must be integrated with research evidence in an evidence-based model. So when talking about evidence-based medicine, the question initially arises, what constitutes evidence? And philosophers talk about this in perhaps a more abstract way than scientists often do. But I'd like to start with some of the opinions of philosophers to get a, a better sense of what we mean when we say evidence. The concept of evidence is inseparable from that of justification. When we talk about evidence in an epistemological sense, we're talking about justification. One thing is evidence for another. So what I think this means is that Evidence is simply information that we use in order to justify a statement, a claim, or a practice. Insofar as we are rational in our beliefs, 
the intensity of belief will tend to correspond to the firmness of the available evidence. Insofar as we are rational, we will drop a belief when we have tried in vain to find evidence for it. This is an important and I think sometimes underemphasized principle underlying the scientific approach. It is important that we find evidence for things, that we validate ideas and hypotheses and particular interventions with research evidence, if possible. And our acceptance of hypotheses is not simply yes or no. We accept a hypothesis provisionally with a degree of faith in that idea that is proportional to the amount of evidence for it. However, science also requires us to accept at some point that the attempt to find evidence in support of an idea has failed and that the idea should be abandoned. That's much harder and I think that we often fail to follow through with that aspect of the scientific approach to deciding what to do as clinicians. We often fail to let go of therapies after we have tried adequately and failed to generate evidence to support them. One more philosopher offers, I think, some insight into how we can view what is or is not evidence. What is credible is not the mere belief in this or that, but having arrived at our belief by a process which, if the evidence had been different, would have led us to a different and contrary belief. So what I take this to mean is that evidence is not simply about supporting the beliefs that we already have. The process of generating and evaluating evidence is an attempt to find out the truth. And if the evidence changes, or if our interpretation of the evidence changes, we must change our belief if we are going to be practicing in an evidence-based way. So what do we draw out of these definitions that, again, illustrates the core of what evidence is? Evidence is data, information, which justifies our beliefs and our practices. Our belief in something is not binary. We don't simply say acupuncture works or it doesn't work, or cephalexin is an effective antibiotic or an ineffective antibiotic. Our belief in ideas and in medical therapies is graded and proportional to the evidence. And the evidence has to be specific enough for our belief to have meaning. Evidence can support or undermine a proposition. And I think we tend naturally to seek out evidence to confirm our beliefs, but evidence which shows us to be wrong or which negates a hypothesis is equally important. And we have to go where the evidence leads, even if it leads to places we don't necessarily want to go. If it leads to accepting therapies, which we tend to be instinctively doubtful about, or if it leads to rejecting therapies, which in our own experience seem to have been effective. We must abandon beliefs when the evidence indicates they are false. And I would go further and say that we must abandon beliefs when sufficient attempts reasonable attempts have been made to find supporting evidence and have not been successful. So what is evidence? On a practical day-to-day -day basis, what counts as evidence in evidence-based medicine? Reasoning from established principles is certainly evidence. We talked a little while ago about the danger of extrapolating from theory, and there's no question that that kind of reasoning from first principles is a fairly weak form of evidence, but it does count as evidence particularly in veterinary medicine where, as I said, we often lack high-quality, extensive clinical trial data. Clinical experience is evidence. Again, I'm not suggesting that simply because our experiences are fallible that they're not useful. And they may, in fact, be the best available current evidence for a particular practice. But as we'll see, the evidence that evidence-based medicine makes use of is graded in a way that places higher quality, more reliable evidence above lower quality evidence, and clinical experience is a fairly low level of evidence. Scientific research is certainly what we usually mean when we talk about evidence, and it is certainly the best quality and, and highest level of evidence we can have to justify a particular clinical intervention. 
even within the, co the category of scientific research, there's a lot of variation in the quality and the reliability of evidence. Now, what is not evidence? Our belief itself, or how strongly we believe in something, is not evidence in favor of an idea. Simply because we believe something, that doesn't lend any credibility to that idea. Belief is generated by many things that have nothing to do with the truth of the proposition that we believe in. And so belief itself is really much more of an emotional or a psychological phenomenon. It's not a reliable way of evaluating the truth of an idea. And the belief of other people, no matter how many people believe in something, no matter how respected those people are, is not reliable evidence for a medical therapy. We've talked a little bit about history and tradition in the context of bloodletting, and the reality is that the history of medicine illustrates quite clearly that the belief of even very smart, very experienced, well-intentioned healthcare providers is not a consistently reliable form of evidence that a particular practice is helpful for our patients. And our lack of evidence, or our incredulity at an idea is also not necessarily evidence for something. People will often make the argument, how could this not be true? Or there's no evidence that this isn't true, so it must be accepted as true. And neither of those approaches is really useful. The absence of evidence simply means that we must maintain a neutral skepticism towards an idea, not that we can accept or reject it. And the fact that it is very difficult for us to believe or not believe something is again, like belief itself, an emotional or a psychological value, not a form of evidence we can rely on in making judgments about medical therapies. All evidence is not created equal. A fundamental principle of evidence-based medicine is that evidence used to make judgments about medical interventions varies in quality, and that we can identify the characteristics of different kinds of evidence that make them more or less reliable. Many of you probably are familiar with the hierarchy of evidence or the evidence pyramid. This is one example. There are many, many ways to organize and identify and characterize the various kinds of evidence that we use when talking about the effectiveness or the safety of medical therapies. But this is a fairly representative example. And the kinds of evidence at the bottom of the pyramid are lower level, they're less reliable, they're more prone to error than the kinds of evidence at the top of the pyramid. In vitro research, uh, things which show us that a particular drug or herb or therapy has an effect on cells in a test tube is certainly evidence that bears on the usefulness of that in treating actual patients. But it's a relatively low level of evidence because it frequently does not accurately predict what the therapy will do when applied to real patients. Going up the pyramid, animal research models are certainly useful but cannot be viewed as definitive. And in the context of veterinary medicine, this often means research in humans. Even high quality research in humans is a relatively low level of evidence when trying to decide whether therapy is useful in a veterinary species because the extrapolation from one species to another reduces the reliability or the usefulness of research evidence. Going on up the pyramid, ideas and opinions, editorials, comments made by respected and experienced doctors are not very high level evidence. They're certainly worth considering, but they have significant limitations. And then there are a series of different kinds of clinical studies, observational studies, investigational studies. Up at the top of the pyramid, we get the systematic review, a formalized, explicit review of many randomized controlled clinical trials, evaluating the quality of those trials and the outcomes, and coming up with an overall conclusion about the therapy that's being investigated. This is certainly the pinnacle of evidence in the evidence-based medicine approach. It is unfortunately also a level of evidence that we rarely have in veterinary medicine.
systematic reviews are beginning to be done and in the future hopefully as our profession progresses we will have more randomized controlled trials with which we can then conduct systematic reviews and meta-analyses and come to more firm conclusions but unfortunately at the present we're often forced to rely on lower level evidence critical appraisal this is an important feature of an evidence-based medicine approach and this unlike primary clinical research is something that applies to ordinary practitioners as well as to academics critical appraisal means that when presented with evidence for a particular therapy or against a particular practice we first evaluate what level of evidence we're dealing with we're familiar with the evidence pyramid or hierarchy and we identify that this particular piece of evidence occupies a certain position there which gives us a sense of how much justification for belief that piece of evidence should give us publication and peer review evidence that is presented in a peer-reviewed journal by definition is going to be more reliable than evidence that is not simply because it has to go through a process of evaluation which helps to identify significant flaws certainly doesn't mean that peer-reviewed research articles are infallible and in fact um, many errors can be found in the scientific literature but they do have a level of quality control that is better than evidence for example that is put up on a website or that is presented by a company in its marketing materials but never published critical appraisal often means evaluating the details of a particular research study and I won't spend a lot of time on all of the kinds of research studies and all of the criteria by which we appraise them that can be quite a technical process but in general if we're looking at a research study it's important to look at how many subjects were involved in the study and whether that particular population is representative of the one we're thinking about using the therapy for a study of six teenage boys may not be useful in deciding whether therapy is appropriate for cats with an entirely different disease or small studies are generally less reliable than large studies and the population of a study is more useful if it is more closely representative of the population we're thinking about using that therapy in. Replication. I cannot stress enough that because of the kinds of sources of error that we've talked about, both in how we evaluate therapies and how we uh, interpret evidence, but also in the nature of the diseases that we're investigating, individual studies can often come up with the wrong answer and so replication is critical in evaluating or appraising critically the quality of the evidence for particular intervention and the source of the evidence is important this is an area which can be controversial but I think it is clear that there are many things that have an influence on the likelihood of a research study having a positive or a negative outcome certainly it's been demonstrated conclusively in human medicine that the source of funding has an influence on the outcome of a research trial studies that are funded by industry tend to find that the products of those industries are effective and despite some of the the significant attempts in studies like that to control for bias some of that bias still leaks through so funding is certainly one issue when evaluating the source of evidence there are also more subtle and again more controversial arguments to be made for relying on some sources of evidence more than others certain countries for example for cultural reasons don't generally publish negative studies and so when evaluating studies from those countries in the literature one has to be careful not to give too much weight to the absence of negative trials concerning a particular therapy because there is a general tendency not to publish negative information that has to be accounted for again I won't spend a lot of time on the details of particular study designs control for bias and for confounding are important aspects to study design blinding is probably uh, uh, the best and most important method for controlling for bias no one who is evaluating the subjects of a study should know what therapy they're getting 
and randomization, assigning subjects randomly to either a placebo or control group of some kind and to the therapeutic group helps tremendously to avoid mistaking other kinds of cause and effect relationships for an effect of the therapy that we're studying. Control groups, randomization, blinding, and once again funding. We must be cautious in over-interpreting the role of funding. The fact that a, a company funds a study and that study finds that that company's product is an effective therapy doesn't automatically mean that we can reject the outcome of that study. It means simply that we need to be very, very aware of the potential bias there and that we need to look at how that was controlled for, how much replication there was, and other factors that may help us to determine how much confidence we can have in those. The bottom line, the shorthand to critical appraisal of evidence is high level evidence is better than low level evidence. Those forms of evidence that are higher up on the hierarchy or the pyramid are more reliable than those that are located farther down. High quality evidence is better than low quality evidence. And when we say quality, we mean things like study design factors, randomization, blinding, things that control for bias and confounding the size of the study population, the appropriateness of the population, the source of the evidence, all of the factors that influence the quality of uh, particular research evidence. I'm not sure that everyone in the evidence-based medicine community would agree with this, but my impression is that negative evidence is more reliable than positive evidence. I wouldn't say that that's an absolute rule, but I do think that many of the biases that we have built into our brains in evaluating the effects of therapies that we're using are in a positive direction. They tend to lead us to believe that those therapies are effective. The simple fact that we are doing a study to evaluate a particular therapy almost always is a result of the fact that we already believe that therapy has some value and we want evidence to confirm that. So studies that find a therapy did not work are actually probably more reliable because most of the biases of the investigators and of the patient owners in that study would tend to generate a positive result. There are certainly exceptions. And finally, and again I cannot emphasize this enough, no single study is definitive evidence. Because of the fallibility of human beings, even well-designed, controlled scientific research can come to the wrong conclusions. There is something known in the human field as the decline effect. There's a tendency for initial, small, low-quality studies of a new therapy to show dramatic positive results. And then over time, as those studies are replicated with larger trials, better methodologies, independent observers or investigators, particularly some who may not accept the initial hypothesis, that positive effect tends to be smaller and smaller and in many cases eventually disappears entirely. This is an example of how easy it is to generate a false positive effect for a therapy that we believe in when studying it and why it's so important that we replicate our research studies and that we do everything possible to control for sources of bias before we make definitive conclusions about particular interventions. A slightly uh, less formal way of saying the same thing is simply don't believe everything you read and even if it appears in a scientific journal one has to appraise it critically and remember that the balance of the evidence is really what counts not the conclusion of any single piece of evidence so finally in talking about what is evidence-based medicine I'd like to take a slightly different perspective in defining it. This comes from the only veterinary textbook, uh, the Handbook of Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine by Cockroft and Holmes. Referring to the earlier definitions that I gave by Sackett and Strauss, Holmes and Cockroft say this succinct and some would say obvious definition of what we all try to do anyway belies the more profound philosophy behind evidence-based veterinary medicine.
at its heart is the confidence in the scientific methodology that has developed over the centuries to enable us to distinguish what is likely to be true from what is likely to be false or unproven. And I think the key words in here are philosophy. There is more than just a set of methods or techniques to evidence-based medicine. There is an approach, a perspective, and also the term scientific methodology. There is a confidence that we must have in science, in the idea that science works, in order to get the full benefit out of the methods and techniques of evidence-based medicine and apply them appropriately, particularly to unconventional therapies which may have very different philosophical perspectives. So from a philosophical or epistemological point of view, what is evidence-based medicine? Uh, philosophy is definitely not a, a field that, that is ordinarily associated with veterinary medicine or even necessarily with practical applied evidence-based medicine. But I think that there is a lot of insight that can be gained by looking at the philosophical underpinnings of evidence-based medicine, particularly when we come later to alternative medicine contrasting the two philosophical or epistemological points of view may be helpful in giving us an approach to evaluating the evidence for and against some of those therapies. So one of the key philosophical principles, and it seems quite obvious, to the scientific approach is realism, the notion that the universe, the physical world, actually exists. It's not a, an illusion or a production of the human mind. And I think most people probably take this for granted, and I doubt very many practitioners of alternative therapies would seriously challenge that notion. But realism also involves the belief that we can learn things about the world through interacting with it. That the impinging of the world on our sense organs generates information. And so true or real knowledge is possible by interacting with the world. That philosophy or that perspective is sometimes called empiricism. Through experimentation, through manipulating the world and interacting with it, we gain true knowledge about it. And I think you will find that there are some elements to the alternative or unconventional medical community who don't accept entirely this notion that our sense perceptions and our interaction with the world generate actual real knowledge. Reductionism. This is something that has become a bit of a dirty word in some circles. The notion that one way to understand complicated phenomena is to investigate their components and see how they function and how they interact with one another to form the complete system that we're interested in. Certainly anything as complicated as a living patient is going to be very difficult for us to understand as a whole all at once. And so reductionism is a powerful tool for understanding complicated things by breaking them down into their component parts. Now it is possible to go too far with this notion and some strong or extreme reductionists may claim that the entire universe is ultimately all understandable on the level of quantum mechanics or that all of medicine and biology can be reduced to simple chemistry. And I think that's not a very widely held view, and there certainly are some legitimate criticisms that can be made of that. But for the point of view of evidence-based medicine, one does have to accept a certain degree of reductionism, that looking at component parts to larger systems is a useful and powerful way to understand those systems. And again, this will contrast, I think, with some of the underpinnings of a lot of alternative therapeutic approaches. Methodological naturalism. This one can be a little tough uh, for people to accept as well. Methodological naturalism is simply the approach in science that science is only interested in the physical or natural world. That the only thing science is capable of saying anything useful about and the only things that are useful as evidence or data in science are physical or natural things, not supernatural things. And this does not necessarily require taking any position on the existence of supernatural things or their importance. Plenty of scientists have very clear and Im opinions about the supernatural and things that they believe in that are very important to them. But it simply says that within the realm of science, we limit ourselves to the natural world. The main reason for that is that we're interested in sharing knowledge and in coming to conclusions that we can demonstrate in tangible ways to other people about how the world works. 
many things outside of the natural, many things that are in the realm of the supernatural, can only be understood through approaches that are inherently subjective, through faith, through introspection, through, through revelation, through mechanisms, the data for which ultimately can't be shared with other people. And science is more productive in some ways because we can share our data with each other. So methodological naturalism is a principle that, that one has to accept if one is going to do scientific research. And again, this is a principle that, like reductionism and empiricism, is not always acceptable to alternative uh, thinkers. Scientific skepticism. Skepticism is another one of those words that I think is misunderstood and has a bit of a, of a dark reputation. Skepticism does not mean the automatic rejection of new or unfamiliar ideas. What it means is requiring all ideas to be held provisionally, to be taken with a neutral perspective until they generate evidence to demonstrate that they're true. And scientific skepticism more narrowly means that empirical scientific evidence is necessary in order to accept or reject a claim about the world. This is a fairly obvious principle of evidence-based medicine because it relies on scientific evidence as the most definitive or the most reliable form of evidence. But I think it's worth articulating and being clear about up front. Criticism. I think that science is inherently a process involving a community. It's not just individual scientists doing their research. It's scientists often in collaboration doing their research, but also then submitting their research to peer review and then publishing their research and having other people either replicate or challenge their research through their own empirical investigations. And criticism and dialogue are a natural and important part of the scientific process. And this certainly does sometimes run up against our, our egos and our desire to be polite and, and sociable with one another and not engage in criticism that might be uh, disturbing to our colleagues. However, criticism is inherently necessary in the scientific approach to uh, gaining knowledge. And this is also something which I think is key to the evidence-based approach, that we must critically appraise all data and all information. And again, a philosophical point of view, which I think sometimes raises trouble when one is trying to apply the evidence-based approach to alternative studies. So we've talked a bit about what evidence-based veterinary medicine is. I think it's important we take a, just a quick minute to look at what it is not, because often I think it is misunderstood or even deliberately caricatured in some circles, and this makes it more difficult for us to know what we mean when we say something is or is not evidence-based medicine. Clearly, it's not perfect, and no one, I think myself included, as a, as a strong proponent of this approach, would argue that it always comes up with the right answer or that it doesn't have flaws. I, I think it's a given that there are things about this method which are imperfect and which could certainly be improved. I would go back to Churchill's comment that it's the best method we've come across. It is imperfect and terrible except by comparison to the other choices, but certainly it has flaws. It is not cookbook medicine. It is not a system which replaces the judgment of the individual clinician with recipes or algorithms that one is required to follow. And I think a lot of clinicians fear that evidence-based medicine will, inter will take away their autonomy and will take away their ability to make decisions in context about individual patients. And hopefully some of the definitions that I've given and talked about make it clear that even the, the founders of this movement and, and proponents of it, such as myself, do not expect that, that research evidence will ever replace the judgment of individual clinicians. It is not exclusively Western. This is a very common criticism of evidence-based and science-based medicine from proponents of alternative approaches. And it is true that science developed within a certain cultural and historical context and that that primarily took place in Europe and North America. And there is certainly some influence of that cultural history on the language and the form of the scientific approach. However, 
scientific medicine and evidence-based medicine are ubiquitous throughout the world. Every culture in the world has adopted this as the primary means for gaining knowledge about health and disease. And it has been very successful in every part of the world. So there's nothing inherently culturally limited to the West or to North America and Europe about the evidence-based veterinary medical approach. So I think it's important that we not confuse the cultural history and the context of the development of this approach with its applicability in the world today. Evidence-based medicine is not impossible. There are those who claim that it is a beautiful academic ideal that cannot be realized in the real world. And this is especially a problem in veterinary medicine because we do have serious limitations in our resources and our ability to generate high-level, high-quality research evidence. However, evidence-based medicine can still be practiced and can still improve the reliability of our clinical judgments and the effectiveness of our therapies even with the limitations that we may face in veterinary medicine. So what's in our way? Why don't we already practice evidence-based medicine? Well, I think there are a number of answers to that. Some of them are cultural, historical, philosophical. Some of them are practical. One of the potential barriers to the implementation of an evidence-based medicine approach in the veterinary field is simply lack of awareness and training. Many people have heard the terminology evidence-based medicine and some of the, the sub-terms underneath that, critical appraisal, systematic review, things like that. But in general, there's not a consistent curriculum in veterinary schools teaching people what evidence-based medicine is and how to practice it. And most veterinarians in one survey that I did recently who, who were asked had never had any formal training in how to go about critically appraising a research article or how to find the literature and incorporate it into their daily practice. So part of the purpose of a, of a presentation like this is to hopefully raise awareness and give people some useful skills in how to apply this practice or this approach to uh, their clinical work. There is unquestionably a lack of high level and high quality evidence available in veterinary medicine, primarily for reasons of resources. It's difficult to generate studies that last long periods of time and incorporate you know, many, many arms and many evaluation methods, particularly high tech methods, large numbers of subjects. We are limited in the evidence that we have available. I do think though that we have enough evidence to do a better job than we currently do. And part of the approach of evidence-based medicine is to generate more evidence. This is particularly an issue when we talk about evaluating unconventional or alternative therapies for which there is generally far less evidence and much lower quality evidence even than exists for conventional therapies in veterinary medicine. We have a lack of tools and access to the evidence. The infamous paywall that blocks many of us in general practice from getting research articles because we don't have a university library that subscribes to these journals and we can't afford to subscribe to them all independently is a serious barrier. So the open access uh, movement within the library community is something that, that we in evidence-based medicine generally support pretty universally because it's, it's very important for practitioners to have access to the evidence in order to use it. And there are many tools that human medicine takes for granted that we don't even know exists in our, exist in our field. Many doctors, for example, can put in diagnostic codes in a patient record and immediately have a list of references for that diagnosis or that condition looking at the, the most current evidence available for treatment, something that is certainly beyond any uh, tools or technologies that we have available today. And I think, to be fair, there may be some lack of motivation. Many people in our profession may believe that their current approach to practice is acceptable and adequate, that there is no need for a more explicit, conscientious use of research evidence to guide their clinical practices. And to be honest, I think veterinary medicine is also spared some of the coercive forces that have driven human medicine in this direction. We're not as likely to be sued and litigation defense is certainly a motivator for applying evidence-based uh, algorithms and protocols and guidelines to one's practice in the human field. Similarly, 
insurance companies don't control the kinds of medicine we employ through their reimbursement decisions uh, the way that they do for the human medical field and that does drive evidence-based medicine to some extent. Insurance companies and in other countries national healthcare systems are very interested in economic efficiency and in only funding those therapies which can be shown through some legitimate scientific means to be effective. And that does drive some evidence-based practice which we you know, don't have as a motivating factor in veterinary medicine. So what do we do now? Given these pragmatic limitations given the fact that the world is not perfect and we can't have everything we want, how do we improve our practice and, and employ an evidence-based approach to the extent that we can? Now what I'd like to do is take some of this theory and some of this background information and distill it down into a fairly efficient practical approach, which you can then use, and which I'll show you how to use, to evaluate therapies you may not be familiar with. Any therapies, but in particular unconventional or alternative therapies, because again, I think the evaluation of those is more challenging for both philosophical and practical reasons. Where do we go from here? How do we find out what works and what doesn't work in the real world? I have developed something which I call the five-step method and that's simply a convenience or, or a way of being more efficient about applying this and helping us to remember the uh, practical steps that one has to go through in evaluating something new. Obviously there are other ways that this could be organized but I think this is, is relatively convenient and that's its primary purpose. The first question that I ask myself when I approach something new and something unconventional is simply what is it? I, I want to get some background information on what the theory behind the, uh, the therapy or the approach is, what the principles are, what the pathophysiological rationale is, what specific agents or manipulations or practices are involved, just what is it? If you learn something about the method that gives you the necessary starting point for asking critical questions. And clearly you can't be an expert on everything despite the internet and the fact that many people feel they can. There are limitations to how much background information you can gather in an inefficient way about a new therapy. But I think some basic background in what things are is useful. And then the question is does it make sense? And that's a, a fairly ordinary way of expressing a, a concept more formally known as biologic plausibility. Could it work is another question you could ask about this. And that certainly is not the end point, and there are certainly ideas which are implausible and which contradict things that we know and turn out to be true, but they are unquestionably the exception. The rule is that things which don't make sense, which contradict well-established, well-known principles of science, are usually wrong. You know, cold fusion didn't work despite the dramatic press conference announcing it and it wasn't a surprise to most physicists that it didn't work because it was based on implausible principles. So I think plausibility is a useful way of evaluating things provisionally, not definitively, but provisionally, particularly when we have limited evidence. If we're going to efficiently target our resources towards investigating and understanding things, we're going to get a better return on that investment if we investigate things for which there is some reasonable plausibility to begin with. Something that is consistent with what we already know is more likely to pay off than something that is a radical departure. Not always, but often enough that I think it's a better bet. And then of course the evidence. Does it work? We want to look at the specific evidence at all levels, preclinical, meaning things like in vitro research, animal model research, research done in species other than our target species, and for us that usually means research done in humans, and then clinical research at all the various levels on the hierarchy from you know case reports up to systematic reviews and meta-analyses if we have them. What is the evidence for or against the idea? And then I've added to this some warning signs there are characteristics of unconventional therapies in particular which I think should warn us that we may be dealing with something that doesn't make sense and that is not likely to be safe or effective and we'll talk a little bit about what those are and finally we make a judgment the fifth step is ultimately we decide should we do it and there are many things involved in that as you can see 
the evidence, the scientific plausibility are certainly part of that, and that's where evidence-based medicine comes in. But we've talked before about integrating client values and our own expertise into that judgment, and I'll look at a few other parameters that we may need to use to decide ultimately whether we should use something. The evidence is a huge part of making that decision, but there are other factors involved, no question. One of the things are the risks and the benefits insofar as we know, how much uncertainty there is about the risks and benefits, how limited is the evidence, and how important is it that we do something. If an animal is in desperate need in, in, in the short term, it may be appropriate to do something even when we're not 100% clear what the right thing to do is. And of course, the circumstances. What the client wants has some bearing on this. What the client can afford has some bearing on this. What we're familiar with, what we're comfortable with, what resources are available, all of these are factors that figure into our judgment. So warning signs, since this is something that is outside of the usual set of steps in the evidence-based critical analysis, I thought I would give you just a few, and there are others, and, and you can look on the SkepVet website, which I list at the end, for some more detail, but these are a few of the more common warning signs. The notion that there is one true answer that applies to everything, and this takes a couple of forms. One form is all diseases have a single cause. Some therapies will begin with the premise that, that we have discovered the one magic reason for all illness, and if we simply apply this therapy to that, we can treat anything, whether it's, it relates in any obvious way to what we're doing or, or not. And likewise, the notion that one therapy can cure everything is another warning sign. If it's too good to be true, it probably is, and that is one element of that. If it apparently can fix any disease, no matter what relationship they have to one another, I think that's a warning sign. No risks or side effects. I like to paraphrase uh, an economist who once said there is no such thing as a free lunch. I would say there's certainly no such thing as a free lunch in physiology. We are dealing with complex systems. A living organism is an incredibly complicated mechanism with interacting parts that are constantly changing and, and influencing one another. And if you influence one aspect or component to that system, if you tinker with it, you are going to have effects throughout the system. And not all of those effects will be ones that you want or that you can predict. So if someone tells you there are absolutely no side effects to something, it's because it absolutely isn't doing anything. And I think that's a rule that, that is undervalued and underestimated and applies as a significant warning sign when you're evaluating some of these unconventional therapies. And things that are inherently mysterious, that cannot be tested by science, that we must take on faith or on the word of satisfied customers or of the people who are inventing and selling a product or a service. I think that evidence-based medicine and a scientific approach ultimately relies on the idea that things can be tested and understood empirically. And remember methodological naturalism. If the only things that you can say about an approach or a therapy come from your introspection or from internal subjective evaluations that aren't accessible to anybody else, that's not science. doesn't absolutely mean that it's not true, but it means that it's a warning sign. We can't view this from a scientific or an evidence-based perspective. And because science has been so successful in medicine, I think we should be suspicious of things that claim science is not applicable to them. Here's an example of some of the parameters that we can use to make decisions even when you know we're not always in the, pres in the possession of the l kind of evidence that we'd like to have. One of the axes that we might evaluate in deciding whether or not to use a therapy is how urgent is it that we act, how critical is the clinical need, balanced against how uncertain are we about the effects of our action, our intervention. What do we actually know about what's going to happen if we do X? And so here's a way to look at this. In the simplest case, the urgency is sometimes high. You have acute hemorrhage, the patient is in hypovolemic shock. There's a great deal of urgency. You have to do something right away or that patient's going to die. And the action in that case that we're talking about, a blood transfusion, is one for which the uncertainty is quite low. 
We know a great deal about blood transfusions, how they work, what are their risks, what are their benefits, how to do them properly. It's a well-established therapy. So when the urgency is high and the uncertainty is high, the logical choice is to take the action. And that one is usually a fairly easy decision for most people. On the other extreme, there are things for which the urgency is quite low. One of the most common that I see is small breed little dogs, particularly white dogs with tear stains. Drives owners crazy. So they come in and they say, I want to do something about this reddish brown staining on my dog's face. I know that in most cases it's a purely cosmetic problem. So I consider the urgency of treating that disorder very low. And sometimes they will come in with remedies because there are a plethora of remedies available for sale on the internet to fix this problem. And there may be herbal remedies or there may be other things. And they'll come to me with information about a particular remedy and say, you know, here's what I want to use. And almost inevitably, there's no research, there's no fundamental plausibility, there's no evidence to tell me whether that is a safe or effective therapy for tear staining. So the uncertainty is quite high. This is a case where the uncertainty is quite high. We don't know what's going to happen if we give this product to the dog. And the urgency is quite low. Frankly, the dog just has a little bit of staining on his face. Who cares, right? Obviously, the owner cares, and that plays into it. But the reality is, from a medical point of view, the urgency is low. I think the default in this position should be not to take the action. I think that's the most rational way to make this balance. And that's difficult for doctors and for owners to choose not to treat something that is not especially important when we don't know for sure what we're doing is still hard but i think it's the right choice if we're thinking rationally then you run into a situation where both the urgency and the uncertainty are low you know a lot about your choices you know the risks and benefits it's well established territory and the problem you're dealing with is not especially urgent or critical I think at that point, it's fairly easy to make a decision to act or not to act, and it depends on other circumstances and other factors, but I think it's fairly easy to make that decision. Here's where things get tough. Here's where you have a high degree of urgency. It's really important clinically that we do something, if possible, because the need is great. But you also have a high degree of uncertainty. We don't know a lot about the potential interventions. We don't have well-established, well-understood in uh, therapies to take it's very difficult to make those decisions and frequently this is an area that alternative medicine fits into chronic diseases where there is significant pain or things like cancer where we're we certainly are going to have morbidity and mortality at a high rate and yet therapies don't have a lot of research behind them we don't know for sure what their risks and benefits are or whether they're going to work it's very difficult to make the decision. And this is an area where I think a lot of these unconventional therapies get fit in because our need, our desire to do something based on the urgency of the situation overwhelms our reticence to do something when we don't really know for sure if it's the right thing to do or if it's going to work.